Mark Lawrence is with us to preview. Good morning, Mark. Morning. Let's start with Chelsea. What have you made of the start that Thomas Tuchel has made at the club? Well, it's good. Um, first and foremost, obviously, he's changed them defensively, so they're far more difficult to score against and obviously play against. It's just a fact now of, of, of working his magic in terms of scoring more goals. I mean, he had umpteen chances at the weekend against uh, against Southampton and unfortunately didn't take any. But no, he's uh, so far so very, very good. But you, you always get this with a new manager. You get this kind of bounce effect and I think he's chopped and changed the team a little bit, which is understandable because he wants to see uh, different players, what he's got in the squad and probably after two or three months make his decision as to how exactly he wants to play with the players that he's got available. Bit of tough love for Callum hudson Adoy as well at the weekend, subbed on, subbed off. Mm. A little bit of a public humiliation if that's not too strong. That can work for a player sometimes though, Mark, can it? Yeah, yeah, well, it's old school, isn't it? it, it, it it's old school and it's, you know, it's done in front of the other players as well. And um, He's now under no illusions. But, uh, you know, he, he, when he comes on, he, he can't work at 90% or 95%. It's 100%. And um, it's a little bit unfortunate because he, he's a young player and he's learning. And I'm not quite sure whether the manager would have done it with a senior player. But, look, if, if he gets a reaction and he starts to play well and make uh, chances and assists and score goals, it's job done. Is that something that a new manager tends to do quite often? Come into the dressing room, lay a marker down, let the players know who's no. boss? No, not not really. I mean, you know, we, we live in a world where you most of the time you can't criticise anybody because all the snowflakes will be out, as, as everybody knows. So I would think that, you know, Thomas Tuchel obviously will, will know him because he's been there, I don't know, for over a month or, or however long at the moment, and he's probably watched him in training and kind of thought, look, you know... Um, I could put my arm around him. Maybe he's tried to put his arm around him and, it, and it's not worked. So it's it's a bit like life. It's either kind of carrot or the stick. It's a donkey effect. And um, sometimes people obviously react to the carrot and other people react to the stick. And it looks like um, your man's got the stick, to be fair. Uh, in the context of tonight's game, then, and in, the, in the context of this tie against Atletico Madrid... It is yeah. a big miss, I think, looking at this team without Thiago Silva. Not just for any old team, but coming up against Luis Suarez. I'd imagine you want a wily old dog at the back to be able to go up against someone like Luis Suarez. The, the street smarts of Thiago Silva might be missed. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It would have been a wily old dog against a wily old dog. I mean, <laughs> and he's, he's been brilliant, uh, Luis Suarez, since he's there. They've got, obviously, Jao Felix as well, and... You know, the thing about Simeone's team is, is that uh, they have this saying in, in Spain, I think it's Colismo, which basically means just, you know, a way of winning. If you remember when uh, Atletico won at, uh, at Anfield and Klopp criticised Simeone's team for the way that he played and, and he just turned around and said, well, look, you know, we, we just play to win and this is the way that it is, whether it's beautiful or whether it's not, it, it's all good. I mean, he's done an absolutely fabulous job there. But yeah, Thiago Silva will be missed. But, you know, I mean, Atletico top of the league, La Liga, it's not the same league anymore as it was kind of three or four years ago. But even so, it's it, it, it's a tough one. It really is a tough one for, uh, for Chelsea tonight. Mark, Atletico a little bit out of form. They dropped four points against Levante over the last week in La Liga coming into mm -hmm. this, so maybe not the worst time to play them. But you spoke about Chelsea struggling to take chances. That potentially becomes a big problem against a Diego, a Diego Simeone coach side who've been so good defensively this season and going back in Europe for quite a few years now. Chelsea don't really have any of their forwards coming into any kind of form into this fixture tonight. No, they don't. They don't. And also, you know, we said that they've chopped and they've, and they've changed. Um, so no, that's, that, that, that's a big thing for them. Um, look, if if you know if they can get an away goal, um, obviously that that would be a be a massive massive boost. But you're right; it might just be a good time to play Atletico Madrid because of the points that they've dropped. But they rarely gets it wrong, Simeone. Um, you know, he's just such a good manager. You'd, you'd kind of love to play for him, but you'd love to be, I say, you wouldn't love to be on the wrong side of him. And his assistant, by the way, have you seen the size of his assistant? Oh, my goodness me. 
um, he'd eat you for breakfast. So, um, <laughs> listen, it, it, it'll need a good performance from Chelsea, and um, you know they, they will get examined in terms of defensively, defensively. And as you said before, without Thiago Silva, it's it's a, it's a big, big miss. Yeah, well, it is Atletico against Chelsea. Kicks off at 8 o'clock tonight. Lazio against Bayern as well is the other game tonight. We wanted to talk to you a little bit about Liverpool as well, Mark. It's obviously been another dark moment for them over the past couple of days, losing yeah. the Merseyside derby at home. Uh, one of the questions I had is, have you seen a plan B or some sort of innovation from Jurgen Klopp at all during this bad spell? No, there isn't There isn't a plan B because he just he just plays this way. He plays this, this pressing game and... You know, a lot of people at weekend say, "Well, he's got to change." I'm not. I'm not sure that he will. Um, you know, obviously, look, listen. Is it 19 central defensive partnerships? It's it's just crazy. And while you can't blame the the, the absence of, of of Van Dijk and Gomez and Matip and all those on a regular basis, it it is it is a massive thing. And that's why I think the goalkeepers had a crisis of confidence a little bit. Um, you know. The, I mean, Quebec's just been thrown in. I feel, I feel, I bet he feels like he's playing at the Coliseum at the moment, and, and not at Anfield. So, it, it's a difficult one. But it's, you know, it's up to. I think the thing with Liverpool is, is do they change the style? I wouldn't have thought so. Would he change them defensively? I wouldn't have thought so either. Because um, I mean, they beat Leipzig last midweek. I think the defeat against Everton was always kind of coming, and then, you know. Klopp went on about the wind and all that, and I mean, he said many years ago, the wind is football's enemy. But Everton did a job on them, and I think a lot of teams in the Premier League will be looking now at the way that Everton did this job on them, and and probably follow suit in the way way that they play. But it's everybody just got you just got to raise your game. You can't make any any more changes in terms of bringing fresh players in, as in you know the transfer window because that's closed. So it's just they've just got to work hard, and if they can get the front three firing, if they can get the front three firing, then they'll win enough games. I still think to get in the Champions League. Is that the barometer of success then for the rest of the season, Mark? Not yeah. only getting into the Champions League, but having those three firing because maybe their own personal form might intensify any talks about that front three perhaps being lured away from Anfield. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean. The other thing I think which which will be a bonus and Diogo Jota can't be far away. He must be really, really close. I know he's been training for a while, so he's really, really close to playing as well. He'll come if he's available. All of a sudden, those front three will look and think, you know, the regular front three think, oh, your man's back. Um, who, who's going to get left out? So, um, yeah, it's, just, it's it's everybody needs pressure. You know, we, we always talk about this is when you, you've had a really successful season and you walk into the dressing room at the start of the next season, and you look around the dressing room, and, and nobody's been signed who's played in your position, you kind of think, oh, that's all right. So you're a little bit in the comfort zone, but if somebody's in there, you're thinking, crikey, he could, he could take my place. And that, that makes a massive difference. So um, difficult to know what he'll do defensively um, at <laughs> the weekend. Looks like Henderson's probably out for three or four weeks, maybe as well. So, so that's a blow. But sometimes, you know, you can oh, you can think so low, and you get to a stage where you think, you know what, sod it, let's let let's just go for it because let's take a chance because we're losing games anyway. Mark, you mentioned how Everton set up and potentially other teams maybe looking at that as a template when they go to play Liverpool for the rest of the season. Just in terms of Seamus Coleman's role, mm. because he played slightly differently at the weekend and he was tasked with first priority, stop Robertson from coming up and giving us problems down the left-hand side. But yeah. also he pressed up high and won the ball in the uh, other half for Everton too. I thought that was a really good performance from Seamus Coleman in a slightly different system than he would have played in before. Oh, yeah. Well, at, t at times he played with a four at the back, um, Everton, and at times it, it was five when kind of Seamus just took in. No, it was a uh, look. Look, the outstanding thing about Everton's victory was the manager, you know, Ancelotti. He got it absolutely, totally right, of which Seamus was, was take loads of praise because of the way he did his job. But because he's an experienced pro, he realised that you know when when Robertson was sat back defending, he could push up. So and that's something that he did. So I mean, he's you know, he, he did really, really well for them. And um, I can't, I can't give Everton enough praise for the way that they play. They just basically worked out every situation that Liverpool 
uh, in the way that Liverpool played and just completely negated them. And, you know, even, even down Liverpool's right, I mean, Trent didn't really get forward on too many occasions. So fair play to Everton. But, yeah, well, well done to Seamus, most definitely. And I guess that Everton win is all the more impressive as well if you consider that Alan and Dominic Calvert-Lewin were just coming back to fitness. Everton have dropped plenty of silly points, which Coleman was talking about after the game. You know, Newcastle at home recently, Fulham at home. They felt they underperformed against West Ham. To go to Anfield, where they hadn't won since 1999, and to put in that type of performance deserves a huge amount of credit too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, um, you know, but, you know, talk about getting it right. I mean, you know, how much Rodriguez, you know, the, the pass was sublime, wasn't it, to, for uh, for his Carlson's goal and... Charleston seemed to enjoy the fact he was playing up front on his own for, for a change rather than with Calvert-Lewin. So they just, everything they did, they, they did absolutely right. Pickford didn't have to make too many saves as well. Um, defensively, you know, Keane and Godfrey and those guys were, were outstanding as well. They just, it, it was a, a top performance. Listen, it, it was always going to come eventually. And... Um, it was at the right time for Everton, obviously, you know, the, the wrong time for Liverpool. So um, let them enjoy it. I've had about 4,000 texts from all the blue noties that I know in the last few days. I should have turned my phone off. But, I mean, you can imagine some of the stuff they've sent through. But, look, good luck to them. They, they deserved it. And, you know, from 1 to 11, they played extremely well. Kevin Kilbane was on to me very soon after the game when I was praising yeah. Seamus Coleman and he was making the point that uh, you know we once upon a time were championing Matt Doherty when Doherty was in good form at the tail end of last season to be starting on the right-hand side for the Republic of Ireland. Doherty got his chance and you know, he got an extended chance because of Seamus Coleman's injury uh, back in September. But mm. the feeling would be now a month out from these very important World Cup qualifiers, Captain Seamus Coleman is straight back into the team at right back now, Mark. You would think so, um, and especially if, if, if you're going to play a back four, because obviously that's something that Seamus has done all his life. I mean, still a really, really good player. The, the problem for Seamus, as we know, is you, you reach a certain age and, and your legs start to go again, and he, he can't go up and down the touchline as much as he could kind of four or five years ago, but he's still very, very experienced. You know, knows how to play that position both defensively and offensively, doesn't give the ball away. And he's a, a real serious and, and fierce competitor. So I would have said, yes, yeah, so that would definitely tick the box. Yeah, and it's at a time as well, I guess, where the defence have been rocked with um, John Egan's injury, Shane yeah. Duffy being out of form at the moment. So having his leadership back into that back four could be very important, particularly if there's you know a young player maybe like Darrow O'Shea starting in the centre of that defence. Having Seamus Coleman to his right is possibly going to be a big help for these qualifiers. Yeah, you can't you can't have enough experience, especially at, at that level, and and it's not just on the pitch, but it, it's also. Off the pitch, off the pitch as well, and, and and the guys who come in relatively inexperienced look to the more experienced ones to help them through, and it's just a matter of you know a little word in someone's ear, an arm around the shoulder, or whatever, and, and trying to make it as, as easy as possible for these guys. Because when they do come in, you know, it it, it is nerve wracking because you feel the pressure. So if you can alleviate any of that pressure in any way, and that's for somebody playing alongside you that's extremely experienced, then it's a definite plus. As Will mentioned there, it is a month out from this Serbia game. I think it's a month tomorrow. And obviously mm -hmm. that John Egan injury last week, Mark, is, I, I guess that changes the conversation a tad around Shane Duffy. Maybe if John Egan is there, it's a, it's an easier benching of, of Shane Duffy not to throw him in there after the terrible time he's had this season. Does that, does that change your for, your mind if you're a Stephen Kenny about starting Shane Duffy or not starting him? Well, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's one of those, you can, you know, if, if, if you're having one of those seasons where, yeah, every time you turn out, it's like you, you're making mistakes and you all of a sudden think you've forgotten how to play the game. So Sometimes when you take that player out of that environment and take him into an environment where he's done extremely well, as in Shane Duffy, with, with, with Ireland, then then the pressure goes off a little bit. So, um, and he's, we know our experience is Duffy. We, we know he's never, ever let us down. He's been one of our most consistent players as well. I think that's just a Stephen Kenny decision when he, when he looks at him and talks to him in and around training and, and, and works out you know, whether he thinks he's, he's, he's of the right sort of mindset to, to want to play and, and to be able to play and obviously to play well. But that, that'll be a, a Stephen Kenny late call, I would suggest.
Yeah, and there's a, a full month of uh, chatting about that very thing, I suspect, coming up, Mark. Just a, a couple of other things just to, to mm. chat to you about. W when the Champions League is written about at the moment, there is this shadow of the European Super League that seems to be lingering over it at the moment. Nobody's quite sure what might happen with that over the next little while, but one thing is for sure, if the Champions League is expanded and more teams are in it, we're going to have more football than ever, even next season. That is even after the season that we've had where there is football <laughs> being on every single night. I, I'm just keen to know, ha have you enjoyed this season as a spectator and are, are you still no. in a place where you want more? No, I haven't. And I've, I've been to quite a few games. I've worked at quite a few games. No, it's just... It's, I mean, I think Guardiola said it on... Uh, I saw his interview before the game at Arsenal at the weekend and he just said it's weird. Yeah, football is absolutely, totally weird. We've seen the results, I think. wasn't at the, at the weekend again, more more uh, away wins than, than home wins. So, no, we don't, we don't need any more football. This, this comes up every now and again. It, you know, the rich clubs are trying to get themselves... Richard, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong across Europe with with the the domiciled leagues, as it were, um, and also the you know the UEFA Cup competitions, and so far as obviously uh, Champions League um, and stuff. So look, no, we, it, it, enough is enough. And some, sometimes you know you can you can kill everybody's enthusiasm by having too much football. And I. I mean, I would watch nearly every single game normally. In the last couple of months, I've probably only watched 50% because you kind of turn on and it's, it's a different stadium and there's no atmosphere, obviously. And you're kind of looking and thinking, do you know what? What's on Netflix? Yeah. Yeah, like that that's true. Like, I, I guess maybe enthusiasm for Brighton against Crystal Palace last night wouldn't have been at an all-time high after <laughs> months and months of action. Listen, like, listen. They have to. They try and sell that as the A23 derby or the M23 derby, and it's like really. I mean, and I used to play for Brighton, and, and there is it, it is a it is a proper derby, but not obviously you know Celtic Rangers, Liverpool, Everton. But I, I, I do laugh. And we've now got to have a, a title or a description before a game of what the game's all about, and it's like for goodness' sake, get on with it. Do you miss the idea of a match day, Mark? The, the sense of concurrent games just happening. It feels like it's one long week of game after game after game rather than this sort of three o'clock Saturday bunch of yeah. games and bunch of excitement. Oh, my, my, my better half died. She just says to me, when it comes to Saturday, she says, what, what we're doing today? And she goes, well, we can't do what generate. And she goes, oh my God, she looked and she goes, so there's football on from 12 until like nine at nine. I said, yep. I'll be on the setting. It's like oh, World War Three, but no, yeah, it's it, it is it is really, really worried. I mean, in many many ways, it's fabulous because you'll be able to watch every single game, and that's great, and it's good for Sky and and, and other TV stations, etc., and companies. But as I said, yeah, after a while, it's a little bit like really, um, and I haven't seen that that many outstanding games. Look. Look, I just think the thing is that the, the best watch in the league at the moment are, are Leeds. I, I've watched every single Leeds game because they're just great to watch, um, why, and the, because they just play the way play football the way you like to play. Except obviously from terms of defensively, because they concede an awful lot of goal, goals. But they just have a real go at everybody. And after watching Leeds, and then you watch another game, you think, "Oh my God, this is completely different," and it's not for the better. Maybe Leeds against Southampton tonight at 6 o'clock is the game to watch as much as the Champions League. Uh, Mark, you mentioned uh, maybe flicking to Netflix there. One thing that is dropping on Netflix this week is a brilliant new Pele documentary. We're speaking to the directors later on this morning on the show. But I just briefly right. wanted to get your memories of, of Pele because it, it certainly struck me that we don't see enough of the guy. We see plenty of Maradona and obviously with the two greats at the moment, we see plenty of them. But maybe Pele is a little bit of a distant memory sometimes. Like, I mean, from 58 all the way up to, to 72. And I'd imagine 72 in particular for you is just such a, a fond memory early in your life. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, um, I think, you know, when when that Brazilian team and that game against England, which, which obviously everybody in England would, would always remember, but that Brazilian team was just absolutely sensational. And, and then, you know, people talk many years on with, with the cry fear about you know, um, total football, etc. That, that that was the way that the Brazilians played. And, and when you think about Pelé and, and watching what, whatever 
footage you ever see of him, he, he gets kicked to hell. Absolutely. I mean, in, in 66, I would be nine, and I remember my, my dad had went to, to Goodison to watch um, Brazil play, and, and, and every time somebody tackled Pelé, they were just kicking him. It was like it, it was just like a soap, but he kept getting up and kept getting on with it. And, and when you looked at some of the goals that he scored, I mean, not just his dribbles and, he, and his finishing, but, you know, in the air, he was absolutely brilliant. He had this kind of leap that came from nowhere. You'll always remember the Gordon Banks save as well, which was, was sensational. But also the way he played the game. If you remember, you know, that, 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 game against, that game against England, when he played against Bobby Moore, and, and straight away at the end of the game, they put their arms around each other and they'd had, a, like, a real fantastic battle. And those days are gone. But, oh, Patelli was just unbelievable. He scored over 1,000 goals. I mean, what's all that about? Yeah, incredible. 1970, not 72, obviously, is what I yeah. meant there. Like, that, that's obviously no. held up as the one. But uh, as you mentioned there, the way he was kicked, 1966 almost seems to me as uh, one of the most important moments in his career because it kind of indicates how genius can still survive even in the midst of this idea of football being all about the brute force and the ability to kick your creative and flair-filled opponent. Well, you know, I'm not being funny. In, in, in those days, in, in the really big game, um, after half an hour, the ref threw the ball on because everyone was just taking lumps out of each other for the first half an hour. It's almost okay, boys. We've had enough of that. Let's you know try and play football now. So, <clears throat> as a striker to live in that era where you got, get away with absolute murder, and you you ask a lot of strikers in the kind of certainly in the seventies, maybe early early eighties, and it, it was a known fact that you could take a lump out of a, a, a striker in the first twenty minutes and get away with it. You just get a warning from the referee and it just to write no more of that. And that's, you know, he, he lived his life with, with, with all of that. And when you think what he did in, uh, was it in Sweden when he, when he first really burst onto the scene and, and, and you think, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, what would he be? 70? Some, something, yeah. like, something like in a, in a World Cup. I mean, you know, tour, transport that to today's way and today's football. Could you, could you? I mean, Sky Sky would have self combusted every time they watched Brazil and Pele, <laughs> wouldn't they? No, they would have done. They'd have run out of superlatives. <laughs> yeah, uh, he probably uh, a, a little bit easier for them to plug than the A24 derby. Let's uh, put it that way, Mark. Twenty-three, uh, Mark right. A23. Oh God, my apologies. My apologies to, to all our uh, Brighton and Crystal Palace fans listening yeah. this morning. Uh, Mark Lawrence, thanks a million. Pleasure. Cheers. Uh, Mark Lawrence there on the line talking everything to do with football as ever. Uh, there is Premier League, there is Champions League. Tonight, 6 o'clock is kickoff time in Leeds against Southampton and 8 o'clock is kickoff time in the two Champions League games.